Hello and welcome to our first video uh, dealing with Russia. We're going to start Russia by having a quick discussion of communist and post-communist countries. All right, so let's go back in time. Let's look at the last hundred years, a little bit more than a hundred years. Advanced industrialized democracies have become the most wealthy and powerful countries around the world. These same countries have been criticized um, for the degree of economic inequality created by their market systems. And here's a question we need to ask. Have advanced democracies encouraged and valued freedom at the expense of equality? And are they ultimately unjust because of this encouragement of uh, freedom? Freedom to make as much money, freedom to be as ex successful as you can possibly be. Um, most people in these advanced democracies uh, would probably answer no. But when you take into account and you start asking communist countries, the resounding answer would, of course, be yes. During that time period, as the world was rapidly industrializing, two large countries became communist nations, the Soviet Union and China. Both of these countries encompassed billions of people and held a huge amount of economic and political influence. Now today, as we sit, communism has collapsed around the world. We've seen it collapse in the Soviet Union, and we've seen it drastically changed in China. There are other communist countries around the world, like North Korea, Cuba, and Vietnam. But its influence has definitely waned since the fall of the Soviet Union. Now let's go back and let's take a look at how communism, or the system, came about. Communism is based on the ideas of Karl Marx. He is considered to be the father of, of communism. And he wrote the book called The Communist Manifesto in 1848. He believed that capitalism exploited workers and increased that gap or inequality between the rich and poor. He believed that this gap was going to grow to be so large that this, the imbalance that it created would lead to revolution. A revolution between the proletariat, the workers, and the bourgeoisie, the owners. He felt that after this revolution, the workers would prevail and a new world would appear. In that new world, there would be no social class. All of that new cooperation gained through revolution and all that equality would definitely lead to a work and a world without private property. And eventually, um, no real need for government. As you can see, Marx had some really idealistic views and ideas on the end result of the revolution. He also had some conditions to where he felt this revolution would take place. Russia was the first country to base its political system on Marxist theory. The revolution of the proletariat occurred in 1917. But this revolution in Russia did not follow the steps or really meet the criteria that Marx outlined back in the mid-1850s. Russia was not an industrialized giant at this time. They had lagged far behind both Britain and the United States in terms of their industrial revolutions. Marx outlined this revolution taking place in an advanced industrialized society. Russia was very backward and didn't have even a portion of the industrialization of the countries or country that Marx envisioned. Now Lenin justified this revolution and based it on Marx's theories with the idea that the Tsar needed to go and that the peasants needed to be released from their oppression and raised. All right, and so the ultimate idea there of balancing the haves and have-nots, the workers versus the owners, was going to be realized by Lenin. It was just going to be done differently than what Marx had envisioned. All right, so that leads us to Leninism. All right, that's the difference where we see Lenin diverging or moving away from those uh, the very clear Marxist ideas. Lenin changed the nature of communism by asserting the importance of what he called the vanguard of the revolution. And the vanguard of revolution could be boiled down to this, a small group of elites. Um, Lenin's government was based on the concept of democratic centralism, rule by a few for the good of the many. And in this case, with Leninism, we're looking at the elites and the party leaders were going to make the decisions for everybody else. 
Now that doesn't really go along with Marx's view. Um, and in most cases, the elites and these high-ranking party members, this clique, was going to make all of the decisions. And once those decisions were going to be made, there wasn't going to be any outside discussion or debate among anyone else. Lenin's government went on to direct both industrial and agricultural development in Russia. So here again, you see the birth of that idea of that small group of leaders, and again, Russia is going to have a long tradition of authoritarian rule under the Tsar. So again, this is just kind of another step. Um, Lenin is also going to gain control of the economy, and it's going to be planned, and it's going to be operated through that elite party membership. Capitalism is still going to exist in Lenin's Russia, but it's going to be restricted. All right, so Lenin's model is going to be very influential because it's going to be the one that everyone else follows. Um, every communist country that's going to come after um, Russia is going to base itself on these Leninist ideals. In Leninism, the Communist Party is the key to the legitimacy of the state. The party has all the power. It's the focal point. All right, and this is the key point. The focus on the vanguard um, and the communist ideology transforms Marxism from this idealistic view of equality into authoritarianism. All right, so if you're talking about the differences as we transition from Marxist ideas into practice with Leninism, because remember, Marx is postulating theory and Lenin is putting it into practice, we see a movement away from that pure communist ideology, that pure equality, and we get to that communist ideology. That's going to transform this idea of Marxism, Leninism, into authoritarianism. Okay? All of the elites in the system are going to be picked by the party. They're going to use a list called the nomenclatura. It's a list of approved party members that are um, basically okay. They get the stamp of approval to fill all of the jobs inside the state and the party and the society. This includes all of the political jobs and things you wouldn't really think would count. Newspaper editors, university presidents, and also military officers. They're all going to get that Communist Party seal of approval. That seal of approval is coming from the highest level of the party, and they are placing these individuals on that approved list. The system does allow a certain amount of social mobility. All right, so that's interesting. Again, when we're talking about communism, we're talking about everyone being equal. But inside this system, in this list of approved members, there is a certain amount of social mobility, which means you can improve your standing all right, over time. Now, that was conditional on a very firm embrace of Communist Party um, ideals. All right, so Maoism. China is going to also take a step towards um, communism and Marxism. Um, it's going to start around the same time as that 1917 revolution, but it's not going to come to full fruition until after 1949. Marx, or excuse me, Mao's interpretation of Marxism was different from Lenin. Maoism is going to share Marx's vision of equality and cooperation. And the big difference between Mao and Lenin is that Mao is going to want to preserve China's peasant-based society. So again, China is another country where it really wasn't an issue of industrialization. They weren't a great industrial giant. Um, China is going to embrace some industrialization over Mao's time and power, because we're talking about a reign of, of decades and decades. But Mao was much more interested in continuing to promote an agriculturally based community and society. All right. That's all going to change in 1976 when Mao dies. Deng Xiaoping is going to gain control over a, a short period of time, and he's going to institute market-based socialism. Um, Mao also embraced the command economy much like Lenin. Again, the Soviets and the Chinese, their systems at the start point were very similar. All right? And again, the big divergence was that Mao was going to interpret Marxism, um, was going to put more focus on the equality, um, and was going to try to maintain China as an agrarian society. Now, China is going to embark on a very smooth and gradual transition to capitalism and markets. All right? and a great portion of their economy is um, available to the market today. This is really a contrast from what eventually happens in the Soviet Union, where Gorbachev is going to try to incrementally move Russia into the market system, um, and it fails. And then Yeltsin is going to use shock therapy, very rapid change, to push um, 
Russia into capitalism. All right, real quick here, a couple slides on some other uh, issues. Gender and communist regimes. Communism envisions complete economic, social, and political equality for women. Generally, this has, or this is in reality, this has never been achieved in any of the communist countries, but it certainly has increased for opportunities for women. If you take a peek in the end, by the end of the 20th century, communist countries had more women in the workforce than their capitalist counterparts. All right, communist political economics or the economy, we're talking about command economies and central planning. There are no markets. There was no private property. Um, and again, both of these principles, according to Marxism, don't really promote that equitable distribution of wealth. Okay, so command economies kind of go hand in hand with the idea of no um, big division between rich and poor. Two big problems have emerged in command economies. Problems with logistics, planning, a, planning an entire economy for a nation as large as China or the Soviet Union, very difficult. Um, the bigger the economy, the bigger the task. The second is that the workers don't really have any incentive because there's no fear of losing their jobs. Industries don't worry about competition and there's not much motivation. These issues proved insurmountable and led to the end of the USSR. If China wouldn't have started its change earlier, it may have also had the same result. All right, so here's some questions as we wrap up. How important and influential is communism today? Both China and Russia have authoritarian governments, even though Russia does have a, a set and a nice framework of democratic um, institutions, they both have authoritarian governments and regimes in place today. Both of these countries have integrated capitalism into their economic systems. Both are big players in international markets and China and Russia continue to set their own rules. Thanks for joining me today in this discussion of Russia. Make sure that you finish up the Google form.